So the Optimal Transport problem is about finding the best possible way of transporting resources from one place to another. So it's a very classical problem um, mm -hmm. coming from economics, but then in fact uh, very classical in the calculus of variations, trying to find a minimizer, an optimizer. Uh, but then, in fact, it turns out that Optimal Transport can be applied to other problems. So it really can be used in completely different areas of mathematics. So one direction that I've been using was to study the so-called isoperimetric inequalities. So these are inequalities coming from geometry, where you try essentially to find optimizers of uh, shapes that optimize the ratio between area and volume. So you're trying with the right powers. So it's a sense you're trying to find objects that have the least possible area with fixed volume. Uh, so the, the answer in this case is given by soap bubbles. So bubbles around are spheres, that's the answer. But then it turns out that isoperimetric inequality, if you change a bit some formulas, uh, can be used to describe the shape of crystals. So crystals uh, take, have a certain shape because they still minimize some kind of surface energy. And um, you just need to change, as I say, some formulas, but it's mathematically almost the same. And then I was got interested in what happens when you take, uh, let's say, the, I, the best, the ideal crystal or the ideal uh, soap bubble, which is completely round, and you give energy to the system by, for instance, heating the crystal. So the, parti the infinitesimal particles that compose the crystal are going to start to move, and you want to understand how the shape changes. And uh, by using optimal transport, I could kind of track the movement of these particles. And it's really through this uh, powerful tool that we were able to prove kind of optimal estimates on how the energy given to the system affects the shape of the, mm -hmm. of the object. In a different direction, optimal transport actually applies to another system that you probably you like, which is the semi-geostrophic equation. So these are, this is a system uh, coming from meteorology, uh, which is very connected to fluid dynamics also. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially you want to model large-scale atmospheric fronts. And uh, it turns out that in, behind this evolution, there is kind of some kind of optimal transport principle that we can kind of model in the following way. So uh, you look at, let's say, at a cloud, for instance, to simplify, mm -hmm. and you look at the particles that compose the cloud, billions of particles, and you look at the cloud at two instants of time. So it's like taking a picture of the cloud and then taking immediately after a second picture. And from picture one to picture two, particles have moved. You have one billion particles on the left, you have one billion particles on the right, and you ask yourself, just by looking at the two pictures, who went where? So can I just, by looking at this, just mm -hmm. at the global picture, understand it, which particle on the light corresponds to which particle to the, right, to the left? And that's not an obvious question because, you know, it's very chaotic. And the optimal transport can be used to give you the answer. So in a sense, you realize that there is a minimization problem behind it where you want to minimize the total kinetic energy dissipated to move from A to B. Mm -hmm. um, so once you understand this connection, uh, this is actually a connection found by Mike Cullen, so a meteorologist in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you are on the right path to try to solve this equation, find something meaningful. Uh, the problem is that even if this connection was found in the 90s, there were uh, several results about optimal transport that still were missing and didn't allow mathematicians really to close the circle and being able to use this optimal transport intuition to apply really to solve these PDEs. Mm -hmm. And essentially that's what I did. So I kind of did the optimal transport work needed to then apply and solve these equations. Mm -hmm. the, your description there gave lots of really nice practical applications. Yeah. Which is often the classical thing say, people say about maths. They're like, oh, but you know, is it actually going to do something? And it's, I think it's great that I think all maths is great, but I think it's particularly great that in your instance you've got these very, very obvious, you know, this we can understand this, this transport thing, we can understand clouds, weather, crystals, like all very, very important things. Have you actually in, like, been able to do experiments or get data to test the theory, or is that like too far advanced, would not be possible? No, it will be possible. The problem is that, uh, of course, um, you know, mathematicians have this attitude, a bit like theoretical physics, to simplify units. So yes. for us, all the units are one, and then the constants don't have really a physical meaning. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, on the semi geostrophic equation is different, because there, I think there is still work needed to really being able to apply to really very physical situations. As yeah. a mathematician, you still need to go by steps. Uh, so the, what we got was the very first result where we could solve these equations. Mm -hmm. um, but for instance, on the crystal, definitely one could uh, try to 
check exactly num numerically what this estimate gives. What I can say is that mathematically the estimate we got is the best possible one. So there is mm -hmm. no way you can improve it uh, just the, in, in the estimates we got. We even got a very concrete number. I mean, like mm -hmm. our formula has very concrete bounds yeah. with the specific constants. Um, we never try to check exactly in experiments how much, the, how, how much they match because one should have to look at the different units involved. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as I say, probably as a pure mathematician and my colleagues as well, who yeah. are a bit lazy about that. <laughs> uh, well, I'm so, obviously thinking as an applied mathematician because I did experiments for my DHS, literally in the lab, you know, in a big tank of water, trying to do models and then trying to see if I could get data to fit. So that was just my first thing when you're talking yeah. about these. I'm just like, oh, well, I, I want to do these experiments. I want to get crystals, add energy, and see if I get the states. I think it would be great. Yeah, I would, I mean, maybe some people already did with yeah. my numbers. <laughs> I never checked. I should be honest, I never yeah. checked. <laughs> and then just one final thing then. Where where are you going next? So I saw in one of the, um, the ICM videos, you said you had a 30 to 40 years worth of a to-do list. But so does this mean you, you, you know you have an idea of exactly what you want to do and where you want to go next? Oh, no, no that's, that will be too much. I think yeah. uh, the reality is that there are a lot of beautiful problems and that are open in mm -hmm. mathematics. I got very excited in the last couple of years about uh, these phase transition problems. Yeah. Uh, so that's something on which I'm still working on very intensively. I think it's a very important line of research where mm -hmm. there is a lot to be done and I really enjoy that. Um, there are other questions still related to optimal transport and that are still in the back of my mind. Mm. Then, uh, you, know, you know, the reality is that making plans never work for me. I don't know, <laughs> probably for most of the people. You plan to do something, uh, but if you plan something over 10 years, most likely it's in five years something will happen in your life that will change mm -hmm. completely. So I try to be on a shorter, two, three years time scale, what I want to yeah. do in the next few years. Uh, for this, it's very good that, you know, uh, as a more senior mathematician, I apply for grants. So I need to be financed for my research. Mm -hmm. And that actually helped for, for me because every time I apply, I usually ask for money for you know, three or five years. And then I have to find the problems on which I want to work on and convince the people that what I'm doing, what I want to do is interesting and mm -hmm. that is worth financing. And this intellectual process of asking for a grant is actually useful because the, you take a moment to sit and just think, what I want to do, yeah. why I want to do, why is interesting, why is worth my time, why is worth your money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all together, and I think sometimes it's useful to have this moment to, to sit down and think a bit. So that's why I said I have, of course, I, I believe I will have problems for the 40, next 30, 40 yeah. years, <laughs> but I go more on a 35 years time scale, and then I, uh, every time yeah. I adjust myself. I think that's very sensible based on how you were describing your mathematical career to date. It almost something would come up and you'd be like, ooh, that's interesting. And like I think that's a great way to to be almost to sort of, you know, yeah, fall something... into the uh, we coming from different backgrounds, sometimes it's very useful because you can bring ideas from a different area of course, inside yeah. something I mean it pays back usually. But yeah. of course you need time, you need energies, you need uh, motivation. Uh, <laughs> but that's our work, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we work for a mathematician. <laughs> yeah.